just by way of uh, brief revision before we go into the, into the New Covenant, just continue and look at some aspects. We found, just uh, quickly, uh, that the Father and the Son at the very beginning had a compact, an agreement, a covenant, the covenant of salvation, where Christ would carry it out and fulfill it, and all the earth, all the nations of the earth would be blessed as a result of that, and that there is only one covenant of salvation. And through time, God revealed that to different people, Adam and Abraham, God gave that promise of salvation. That's why we have this everlasting covenant there. Anyone who has been or will ever be saved is only saved by that one covenant of the Father and the Son. The everlasting covenant or this new covenant. That's how Abraham will be saved. That's how anyone living on this side will be saved. But as time went on, God gave another revelation on Mount Sinai. He gave a system of types and shadows and symbols called the Old Covenant. And that system was to last until the time of the seed, when the seed would come. And so when the seed came, he took away the first that he might establish the second. You see, up until that time, this second or this new covenant was not yet established. It was promised, and people believed that promise, but there was a time when it would be established, or a time when it would be ratified. And this is where we want to pick up our, our story. And so that's just a, a, brief, a brief review as to the covenant. Particularly now we want to focus on the new covenant. The new covenant being the man Christ Jesus. Like the Bible told us, we just read it, and I will give thee for a covenant of the people. And particularly, Christ referred to something when he was instituting and establishing this new covenant. Luke chapter 22 and verse 20. At the Last Supper, at the close of Christ's ministry on earth, he said to his disciples, Likewise also, the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Jesus here was talking about establishing this new covenant. And notice what he says here. You know, I, I, I'm sure we all read these verses many times. We can even recite them by heart, but something stood out to me when I was reading this verse once that I'd never seen before. Jesus says here that the New Testament or the New Covenant is where? In His blood. Does that sound a bit puzzling? Well, if you understand that blood is what? Life. So Jesus is basically telling His disciples, take this symbol here and drink it. This represents what? The new covenant in my life. The life of Christ contains the new covenant. That's what he's saying, right? Christ is that covenant and the active component and ingredient of this new covenant is the life of Christ represented by this blood. He was about to go to the cross a few hours later and actually give his life as an atonement for sin. And so he's telling his disciples, listen, take, this is now what this covenant is all about. It's about my life. This covenant is in my life. I don't want us to miss this, brothers and sisters, because this helps us appreciate the fact that the new covenant is between the Father and the Son and no one else. They don't have another helper who pops up on this side of the cross to come and work in this covenant called God the Holy Spirit or anyone other than Christ. Christ is the covenant and no one else. You with me? Mm -hmm. And so um, a confusion, a misunderstanding of the true revelation of what God has given about Himself in the Scriptures destroys all these things. The covenant is in the blood of Christ. But a lot of people believe that Christ has left us here on earth, left and went uh, up to heaven, and sends us someone else to help us in this journey of the new covenant. This is not what the Bible teaches. The new covenant is in His blood. This covenant is between God and Christ. And of course, Christ here was speaking as a man. This is another very important component of this new covenant. Part of the deal or part of the compact or the promise that was made between the Father and the Son is that Christ would be a man. He would come of the seed of Abraham. He would give his life and he would permanently remain as a man to ensure the salvation of mankind. 
That's why at the close of his work, a little before this event in John 17, Jesus prayed to his father. He says, Father, I've finished the work which you gave me to do. Isn't that right? He was speaking there as a man. Because it was man that he had come to save. It was the seed of Abraham. Well, the children of Abraham. All the, it was the seed of Adam, really. Uh, the children, offspring of Adam that he had come to save. The whole human race. That was the purpose of his mission. And he had to be a man in order to accomplish that. Because the Bible refers to him as the last Adam, correct? Mm -hmm. Very, very significant term. Hopefully we'll explore, explore it a little bit as we go along. But this, this covenant is in his blood. It's in his life. This is what the new covenant is, brothers and sisters. The new covenant is not a set of rules and instructions. The new covenant is not a set of doctrines and beliefs you adhere to. The new covenant is simply and profoundly the life of the Son. That's it. Some people say, well, that's it. What more do you need than the life of the Son? He that has the Son has what? Has life. And if the Son therefore make you free, you shall be free indeed. This is what the New Covenant is all about. It was this life that all the people from Adam to Abraham to Moses and down through history, they were looking forward to the time when that life would come and be encapsulated in a human being, the seed. And when that would come, all these prophecies that pointed forward to that would cease because now the real thing is here. And so Jesus at that Last Supper, He tells His disciples, take, drink this. This is the New Covenant in my blood. Very, very profound and significant verse. And so, like I said, one day I saw that and it hit me like it never hit me before. And I was glad for the hit. It was a blessed revelation. And so this is what the New Covenant is all about. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16 and 17. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Interesting verse. A testament is a covenant. Another word for testament is covenant. Here Paul is emphasizing the fact that a covenant, in order for a covenant to be valid, or as he says here, to be of force, something has to happen. What must happen? The death of? The testator or the covenant, forget trying that word, the death of the testator, the one who made a promise in the covenant, okay? Who had made a promise in this covenant between the Father and the Son? Christ had promised to give His life as a ransom for many. And that covenant, Paul here says, was only of force after the testator died. That's why Christ had to come. And when he was about to die, he tells his disciples, listen, take drink. This is the covenant in my blood, in my life. He was about to lay down this life. He was about, in other words, he was about to bring about the establishment and the enforcing of this new covenant, which up until that time was promised. There is this transition here. And that is why, a little earlier we read, in the old covenant, there was still also required the death of a sacrifice and the sprinkling of blood to ratify that covenant as a symbol and a type for this ratification of this covenant when Christ himself would die and accomplish that. And so, <clears throat> based on what Christ would accomplish, the Father also promised to accept and bless mankind and to treat them as he treats his very own begotten and beloved son. That's, that's the deal. Christ accomplished that and he tells his father, I finished the work which you gave me to do. Now all these people, I claim them as mine. And that's what happens, brothers and sisters. God treats us as his son, not because of any great wonderful achievement we've accomplished, but because the son has become one of us. And if we accept the son, we have the status and the treatment that the son receives. That's, uh, that's good news. Amazing good news. And this is the realization of this uh, compact. Now, when talking about the ratification of the covenant, which obviously happened at the cross when Christ died, uh, sometimes uh, I hear some, some people, you know, they might be a little bit uncomfortable with that because 
I'm not sure why, so I'm not going to try and attempt that. But one of the most abused verses in this context is in the book of Revelation. And this verse, I think you'll know it straight away as soon as we put it up. Revelation 13, 8, particularly the last part of the verse. But I'll read the whole thing. It says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Familiar with that verse? And so when we talk about the death of Christ dying on the cross, and that's the time when the new covenant was ratified and made of force, some people say, well, hold on, hold on a minute, brother. You have to remember, the book of Revelation says that Christ was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And the reason why this verse is used is perhaps, well, it, the, the idea that's, that's being portrayed is, hold on, maybe, you know, something happened that Christ did from the foundation of the world that somehow has already activated or ratified the covenant. Now, I want, to, I want to tell you right quick, that is a total abuse of this verse. That is not what this verse is saying whatsoever. And I'll explore why I'm saying that, but uh, here is, here's a little homework you can do when you go home. Go in the book of Re Revelation and look up lamb and slain. So I'm going to take you a long study and see how the book of Revelation uses lamb and slain. What, what does it mean here when it says he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world? There is no question that the Father and the Son, when they covenanted before the begin, in the beginning, before anything was created, Christ promised to give his life should man fall. There's no question about that. But sometimes the way this verse is used, people, you know, I don't know how, but I've heard it. Like there was some kind of a mystical, spiritual death of the lamb back then, because the verse says the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. You, you know, if some of you are puzzled by that, I'm just as puzzled, but I've heard this. Because it seems in, in, in people's mind that, no, the, the, the new covenant had to exist in exactly the same force and exactly the same way all through human history. It doesn't make sense for it to be ratified at the cross and therefore certain results come about that weren't there before. And so trying to put the cross of Christ all the way at the beginning based on this verse. And this is what I actually heard and some people said, you know, the cross of Christ is right there from the foundation of the world. Only as a promise, brothers and sisters, not in reality. Now I want to I uh, look at this verse a little closer and compare it with another one. Here it is on the left, the one we just read. Here is a parallel verse that I think explains it quite easily and plainly in Revelation 17, 8. Notice what it says. The beast that thou sowest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wander. And this is the part we want to focus on. Whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. If you compare the two, it's talking about the same thing. It's talking about the book of life and names being written in the book of life. 17.8 tells us when the names are written in the book of life. It says they're written when? From the foundation of the world. So if the parallel holds true, therefore foundation of the world in Revelation 13.8 should apply to what? To the book of life, not to the lamb slain. In other words, if you read in another translation, this is what it says. I'll just read the, the yellow hi highlighted bits, it's just easier. It says, whose name hath not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that hath been slain. It changes things. It changes the meaning. In other words, when John wrote the book of Revelation, around about 100 AD or so, about 100 years after the Lamb was slain, this is what he's talking about saying these people's names were written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. The Lamb that was slain, that's the Lamb that I'm talking about. You with me? You see, John is not trying to say that Christ had some kind of a mystical, spiritual death before the foundation of the world. It's obviously a symbolic feature, and if you want to take it that way, you cannot abuse the verse and put the cross at the foundation of the world. It just does not work. Anyway, look up all the references of Lamb and slain in the book of Revelation. It's quite self-explanatory. Now, don't get me wrong. There's no doubt that Christ was promised to be the Savior from the foundation of the world in that covenant made between the Father and the Son. 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20 talks about that. It says, but with the, uh, how we have been redeemed, that we've been redeemed with the precious blood of, of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest 
in these last times for you. What does foreordained mean? Predestinated to know beforehand or promised to come about. Christ did not, was not slain before the foundation of the world. Christ was slain at one point, one point in history. That was on the cross. But he was promised and for, ordained to be that savior from the foundation of the world. You see, the reason, another reason why uh, I find that people do that is that the benefits of the slaying of Christ, and we're going to look at our chart and put it there in a minute, but the benefits of the death of Christ, there are certain benefits that result that only apply after the cross and not before. I'll say that again. There are certain benefits of the death of Christ that only apply after the cross and not before. Now, it seems to me that to some people, this is unfair. And so they try and put all the benefits of what the cross accomplished before the cross. And so you say, well, maybe the cross was here and you start, you know, everything starts swimming. And you have this hazy, nothing anchored understanding of covenants and the gospel, which is really an abuse of the covenants and the gospel. This is really what it, what it is. Hopefully it'll clear up as we go along. But I just want to put that thought out there because some people use these verses in a way that the Bible does not intend. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25 and 26 tells us about Christ. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. It says Christ has not suffered repeatedly from the foundations of the world. That plan would, was looking forward to one event, and he did that once when he came and died for sin. That's what Peter was talking about, that he was manifest. He was foreordained from the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. He was revealed, and he carried out that promise. So we need to watch for that because there is a danger of spiritualizing what Christ has accomplished and putting the cross, making the cross into this mystical thing where Christ was suffering from the foundation of the world and suffering and suffering. And his death on the cross was only one manifestation of what he has been suffering all along. The Bible, brothers and sisters, does not teach that. That is a species of spiritualism. The Bible teaches that Christ suffered once on the cross. Now, don't get me wrong. Sin, of course, broke God's heart. It says uh, in the flood that, you know, he was grieved with man because of all their sins. Sin hurt God's heart, but the suffering of Christ, that is the cross suffering, happened once as a man who was tempted and met with sin and overcame sin and Satan. And this, as a result of that, it gives us amazing results, things that are available to us before the cross, uh, sorry, after the cross that were not before. You see, if all the results of the cross were available before Christ died on the cross, it really destroys the impact of the crucifixion of Christ and his death for sin. In other words, his death really brought nothing new because everything was already there. It diminishes the effect and the impact of what the cross of Christ accomplished. And that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible actually gives us an, a different picture. It's actually kind of like when a person who believes in the Trinity says that the Holy Spirit is a different person to Christ, but He gives us all the help we need to overcome sin. But He never experienced sin, was never even a man, and never overcame. But He gives us something that He never had. It's, it's a similar type of error. It's like the things that Christ accomplished on the cross were already there from before. That's not the case. And we're going to see some of them because it, it helps us appreciate them a little bit more. So let's go back to our, uh, our chart and just put up some things here in light of what we found so far. We saw that the covenant was ratified. The old covenant was ratified on, at Sinai. And Christ, when he was on the cross, ratified 
the new covenant when he said it is finished. When he said it is finished, who was he talking to? He was addressing the Father, right? This compact, this agreement that they had together is now finished. The reality had come. The plan of salvation is now fulfilled. It is finished. And that's what ratifies and therefore makes that new covenant of force. Two ratifications that exist in time. There's no question about that. And, and they are consecutive. Now as a result of that, if we look at the, at the new covenant, the everlasting covenant, there are two very distinct phases of this everlasting covenant. There was the phase before the cross where that covenant was still unratified and it was given by promise. That's how it was given to Adam. That's how it was given to Abraham. That's how it was given to all the faithful before the cross. They believed that promise and because of their faith in that promise, that's how they would be saved. And then the next phase in that same covenant is when that covenant has been ratified or enforced and all these promises are now fulfilled. You with me? And as a result of the fulfillment of the promises, certain things come about that were not possible before. And we'll see some of them. But uh, Christ, of course, when he uh, was at that Last Supper, as we said, he said this new covenant is in his blood or in his life. Now, don't, don't miss the point that when he says in my life or in my blood, he's speaking there as a man, as a human being. But as a human being, he did not cease to be the Son of God. He was both... Son of God and Son of Man. He was a divine human being. The first one of a kind called the last Adam. And that's how he fulfilled that covenant. And he says, this is in my blood. And so as a result of that, we now can have the Holy Spirit poured out in its fullness. And we understand hopefully what the Holy Spirit is. It is the life of? Of Christ. So if I was to define that a little bit closer. In other words, it is the divine human life of the Son. Now it can be poured out fully. I'll ask you a question. Was the divine human life of the Son available before the cross? You sure about that? What, was, what life was available before the cross? The divine life of the Son. Now, don't get me wrong. There was the Spirit of God working and operating before the cross. But that Spirit of God did not have a human element because the Son had not yet become the seed. When He became the seed, He took on humanity and He linked, He fused together His divine existence and life with a human existence, creating this new person, a divine human person. And when He died, He says, this is the covenant in my blood. Now I give you this life. This is why we receive now this life. And of course, another benefit of that is we now also have a divine human high priest. These are some of the elements and benefits, brothers and sisters, of this new covenant. There's a lot more, but I'll just summarize just a, a brief few here because I want to focus on the life of Christ. This is what the Holy Spirit is to us today since the cross. That's why when, we, when, when there's a teaching that the Holy Spirit is a different person to Christ, it totally destroys the new covenant that God designed to give to us. This life is the life of the last Adam or the second Adam. That's the life that he gives to us. This is the, the new race of being someone mentioned. Where you now, we're all children of the first Adam. We receive a dying life. We need to be born again into the family of the last Adam. We now receive his divine life, divine human life. And so this is what it's all about. Is there any more there? Okay, yeah, first Adam and last Adam. And uh, as the last Adam, uh, I want to mention this as well. The fact that Christ took on humanity permanently is the greatest evidence and guarantee that humanity will never again be separated from God. The Son of God now is one of us. You see, the problem of sin is it came in between us and God and separated humanity from God. You know why sin is not going to rise another time? It's not because all of us have learned the lesson and we won't do it again. That's part of it. It's because the Son of God is a human being. He will never be separated from His Father again. 
And if we have his life, we are in that family of the second Adam. Humanity is permanently restored forever with God. That's what the new covenant was designed to accomplish. That's why he made it. When he said it is finished, he said that as the last Adam. And now he gives us this life. Brothers and sisters, this new covenant is, is out of this world. Literally. It's fantastic news that we can have the life of the Son. And that's why, like I said, the Trinity destroys this aspect that the Spirit is really the life of the Son. <clears throat> when we come into the family of the last Adam, we receive all the benefits of this covenant. That's where God says, I will, uh, I've, he told Abraham, all nations will be blessed in your seed. We receive all the blessings of this new covenant as a result of coming into the family of the second Adam. That's what it takes, brothers and sisters. We don't come into the family of the second Adam through Sabbath keeping or through believing certain creeds or doctrines. We don't get that by eating vegetarian meals or by wearing certain kinds of dresses. Or, you, you with me? We have put a lot of these things which are good in and of themselves. We have put them just like the Jews did. We thought, oh, God gave us all these things. Well, this is how we can enter into a relationship with God. And we diminish the active ingredient of this new or last covenant. <coughs> That's why the scripture tells us in John, you know, you know the verse... It says, and truly our fellowship is with who? With the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, right? And no one else. There is no one else. We now enter into fellowship with the two who covenanted to redeem mankind, the Father and the Son. That's why Jesus, when He told His disciples, if a man love me, he'll keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the active ingredient of the new covenant. The everlasting covenant. The only covenant that saves is that one. <clears throat> and this is the question to you and me. Do you have that today? And do I have that today? Are you in the new covenant or not? And uh, I want you to think about that. Like I said, that's the only condition. Jesus says my, the new covenant is in my blood. Now, the way we obtain that, and I want to I want to say this carefully. I don't want people to misunderstand me. The way the way we obtain that, brothers and sisters, the only way we obtain that is by faith. It's not even by commandment keeping. It's not by ten commandment keeping. It is purely and simply by faith, first and foremost. And it is from faith to faith. When we have the life of the Son, there is no question that the life of the Son in us will be a glorious manifestation of the righteousness of God, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Too often we try and check and make sure that our life is in harmony with things, and, and, and it's not about our life. The life of the Son is automatically in harmony with the right. It is the righteousness of God. It's not in harmony. It is the righteousness of God. That's why the Bible says, Christ is made unto us wisdom and sanctification and redemption. He is all these things to us and righteousness. So that's the question. Do you have the life of the Son or not? That's the only way to be made in His image. That's what we're talking about here, right? That's the only way to be made into His image. So that's uh, my appeal and my challenge as far as the new covenant is concerned. Because I don't want us to just look at that as information and detail and say, okay, I understand the covenants. That's not going to help. Understanding the covenants is not going to save anyone. It is having the covenant, having Christ. He is that covenant. Now, in sharing that, I want to append a section here in, in the little time that we have left. I want to append a section to this study. We're pretty much finished as far as the Bible is concerned. But I want to append a section that has to do with Ellen White. And the reason is this, like I said before. Sadly, some people, all this evidence from the, from the Scripture is somehow not conclusive or lacking. As far as I'm concerned, the case is closed. The scripture is clear. And I hope it's clear enough for you. We've seen the evidence. This is a bit, a bit of a summary to it, but, uh, of it. But I want to look at, at what Ellen White has to say because a lot of people make claims and say, you know what? Ellen White teaches different to this. 
You know, that's, that's to put Ellen White contrary to the Bible. Well, this is out of the Bible. This is not contrary. You know, Ellen White is not going to be contrary to that. And we're going to see that. But for some reason, I, I'm not sure what the reason is, but people say, you know, well, 1888 and the covenants and all these things, that this is wrong. This is not what's being taught. And they produce some statements maybe from Wagner and Jones and sometimes Ellen White. And to try and say different. So I want to go to Ellen White. There's, there's no... No one should be afraid of that. We'll go to Ellen White and see what Ellen White has to say and see if, if by any means she has something to say about that and whether it is in harmony or whether it is not. Because like I said, you know, I've, I've discussed this enough times with people and, and the issue of the covenants is one that, that causes a lot, of, a lot of confusion. If you don't believe me, go talk to some people about the covenants and ask them what they understand. You're going to get a, a whole variety of ideas. You could write a book about it. Let's look at some things that the Spirit of Prophecy has to say. Were there, were there two divisions of the everlasting covenant in the Spirit of Prophecy? Because we saw, some, we saw the, what we found so far as the one on the chart. Here's what this one says, Patriarchs and Prophets. Though this covenant was made with Adam and renewed to Abraham, it could not be ratified until the death of Christ. This is talking about the everlasting covenant or the new covenant. It could not be ratified until the death of Christ. It had existed by the promise of God since the first intimation of redemption had been given, it had been accepted by faith. Yet when ratified by Christ, it is called a new covenant. So are there two phases to it? Yes. One phase is by promise. The other phase is when it is ratified. You know, sometimes people will, say, will see this and say, oh, okay, I can accept what the preacher said now. But the Bible said that already, brothers and sisters. If this is how we are as Adventists, we are in serious trouble. We are diluting the Word of God. It's like the Word of God is not good enough on its own. We have to supplement it with some quotes. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the spirit of prophecy. And it's beautiful and it's important. But it was never meant to be peppered to strengthen what the Bible says. It was never intended for that. So, two phases to that covenant. The phase of promise, and when it is ratified, the phase of when it's ratified, obviously, and when it is fulfilled, and that's when that new covenant is of force. Are the two covenants consecutive? This is an issue, like I said, a lot of people say, well, no, you know, the covenants, they're not consecutive. They're always running parallel. The old and new covenant have both existed from Eden till the, uh, till the second coming of Christ. That is the case only as an allegory, as we saw. Only as a mindset, when you make a personal application of the covenants, one of works and one of faith, how you relate to God, you can have an old covenant mindset or a new covenant mindset as an allegory. But they're definitely consecutive as far as they existed in time. Let's have a look at what it says here. Another compact called in the scripture the Old Covenant was formed between God and Israel at Sinai and was then ratified by the blood of a sacrifice. The Abrahamic Covenant was ratified by the blood of Christ. And it is called the second or new covenant because the blood by which it was sealed was shed after the blood of the first covenant. That's consecutive. You have the first covenant and it was ratified. And then you have the second or new covenant and when that is ratified. One was ratified at Sinai. One was ratified at the cross. They follow each other. If you teach otherwise, you are going contrary to the Bible. And to the spirit of prophecy. There you go. I'll add that one as well. Because <laughs> that's, that's what a lot of people say. You know, I believe things, brother, according to the Bible, spirit of prophecy. Sorry, excuse me. That's great, and that's good, but the Bible is the word of God, brothers and sisters. That's what the spirit of prophecy actually tells us. So they're consecutive, okay? Let's look at another one. How long do the covenants last? Are they eternal? As the Bible presents two laws, one changeless and eternal, the other provisional and temporary, so there are two covenants. There is an eternal covenant with an eternal law, and there is a temporary provisional covenant with a temporary provisional law. The temporary provisional one is the old covenant or the first covenant. And so, it's very clear that Ellen White recognized the covenants existing in time and having markers in time. There is no question about that. There's no need to go overboard to try and prove one point to deny the other, brothers and sisters. 
And so as we said before, <coughs> how we relate to God is something that is a personal application to all of us, but that does not deny the fact of what we just read here. Uh, let's look at another one. The kingdom of grace in two phases. Kingdom of grace is another name for the new covenant. Here's this one. God's work... Uh, it's actually this quote, sorry. The kingdom of grace was instituted immediately after the fall of man when a plan was devised for the redemption of the guilty race. It then existed in the purpose and by the promise of God and through faith men could become its subjects. Yet it was not actually established until the death of Christ. But when the Savior yielded up his life and with his expiring breath cried out, it is finished, then the fulfillment of the plan of redemption was assured. The promise of salvation made to the sinful pair in Eden was ratified. The kingdom of grace, which had before existed by the promise of God, was then established. Hallelujah. That is the truth, brothers and sisters. The kingdom of grace or the new covenant has these two phases. The phase of promise, that's stage one. The stage of ratification that's stage two. And it was during the phase of promise that God instituted and installed this old covenant as a system of types and shadows to prophesy and foretell the time of the new covenant when it would come and it would last up until that time. Uh, like I said before, the reason when it, many times people want to maintain you know, that everything was there all the time is because I have found that some people have a real problem in accepting that God provides certain things in certain ages that were not available before. I'll say that again. The fact that God provides certain things in certain ages that were not available before, some people find that perhaps unfair. And so they try and maintain a fair picture of God with very good motives, and thereby they destroy what God actually said and planned and designed. Listen, brothers and sisters, the plan of salvation is God's plan, not ours. We don't have a right to modify it to fit our standard of what's fair and not fair. God planned it. All you have to do is believe it, not change it, and then take the cross and put it over there and say, well, it was here, and, and, and make everything swim up in the air, which is what happens. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is what people believe, and this is why there's so much confusion. You make the whole plan of salvation swim up in the air, and nothing is secure like God said, because you are, with all good intentions and motives, setting out to keep God fair in your opinion. God did not hire you as his lawyer to keep him fair. He is fair. He is more fair than you and I ever think or imagine, brothers and sisters. And let's not keep uh, twisting what he has told us because it doesn't fit with our standard of what we think should, the plan of salvation should be like. We're not assistants in the plan. We're not modifiers of the plan. All you have to do is accept the plan. If you don't like it, that's just how it is. You don't have any right to change it. Abraham tried that and that didn't work. The, the reason why I'm emphatic on this, and I don't want to be offensive when I say this, but brothers and sisters, the gospel is destroyed in many people's minds because of some of these things. That's why I want to go the extra mile, hopefully, and, and, and clarify things as much as possible. Does God do different things in different ages? Let's look at this one. Uh, Patriarchs and Prophets again. God's work is the same in all time. Although there are different degrees of development and different manifestations of his power to meet the wants of men in different ages. Okay? God is the same. He doesn't change. But there are different ages where God works differently and he manifests his power differently. Sometimes more, sometimes less. That's what it says. Beginning with the first gospel promise and coming down through the patriarchal and Jewish age, ages and even to the present time there has been a gradual unfolding of the purposes of God in the plan of redemption God is revealing more things we have more light now than some people did back then does that make God unfair no and we as a result of the new covenant have certain things available to us now that were not available before and that does not make God unfair that makes God a wonderful savior praise the Lord for them for those things. So, <clears throat> I think we read that and we read that. Okay, 
we'll go back to our chart. And, and this is the thing. Different ages, God is the same God, is the same plan of salvation, but there are different revelations and phases of that plan. And when people look at that, sometimes they say, well, you know what, this, this, is, uh, this is dispensational. This is, what you're teaching here is different dispensations. Yes, that's right. I don't want to, you know, confuse anyone. I am teaching, because the Bible is teaching, that there are different dispensations. And a dispensation simply means, you know, a certain time period where, where God interacted and related in a particular way. There are different dispensations. This is Bible teaching and this is also spirit of prophecy teaching. Because I've heard it many times used in a derogatory manner. Like if you believe in dispensations, you're... You know, you don't believe the truth or it's a heresy to believe. It's not, brothers and sisters, the scriptures make very clear that there are different dispensations in the history of mankind where God dealt with people in certain ways that are not always the same. God required sacrifices at one point of animals. He does not require that now. We're in a different dispensation. But it wasn't just the sacrifices. But anyway, does the Spirit of Prophecy have anything to say about that? as far as dispensations. It says the prophet John, the Baptist that is, was the connecting link between the two dispensations. One before John and one after John. So Ellen White was a dispensationalist, okay? Make no mistake about it, because the Bible teaches that. They are consecutive dispensations, not parallel dispensations. Here's another <coughs> one as well that, that spells it out even clearer. This Sabbath commandment is the great truth which unites the two dispensations, the Mosaic and the Christian. And the light upon the sanctuary shows their relation to each other. So there is a Mosaic dispensation and there is a Christian dispensation. Some things are common denominators across the dispensations. Some things are exclusive to each dispensation. You with me? That's God's plan of salvation. This is how he set it up. This is how he revealed it in the scriptures. I'm just telling you what's there. I did not make it up. I did not, uh, you know, dream this up. This is written. And the spirit of prophecy has that to say about it as well. Even though there are different dispensations, of course, it's the same plan of salvation working. And this is the problem some people have. They, they think, oh, different dispensations. You're teaching that people are saved in different ways in different dispensations. No. It's the same, there's only one saving covenant, right? One plan of salvation. It's not different means of salvation. The work of salvation in both the Old and New Testament dispensation is the same. Christ was the foundation of the whole Jewish economy. The types and shadows under which the Jews worshipped all pointed forward to the world's Redeemer. It was by faith in a coming Savior that sinners were saved then. It is through faith in Christ that they are justified today. So, you can have two dispensations, but that does not necessarily mean there is a different plan of salvation in each one. It's the same plan. It's always based on Christ. But we also saw that in that one plan of salvation, there are two very clear phases. One of promise, promise in a coming Savior, that's what the types foreshadowed. And one is a fulfilled promise, where we look back to the reality of the cross and the reality of Christ living in us now. We have greater light in our dispensation. I mentioned that already, but here is a statement that says that. If God's people who lived in the Old Testament dispensation were to shine out brightly upon a world of idolaters, His people who live in this age, having so many more privileges and so much greater light, should shine forth still more brightly, diffusing light everywhere. So one dispensation was darker than the other according to the spirit of prophecy, right? If one has greater light than the other one has? Less light, right? This is in the spirit of prophecy. You know, so some, this is shocking to some people. A lot of people believe that to believe that is heresy. That's what the Bible teaches, brothers and sisters. The Bible also says the path of the justice is the shining light that shines more and more unto a perfect day. We have a more perfect day. We have a better understanding of the plan of salvation that God has revealed today than there was before. The plan has already been fulfilled. We have that. Here's another one to the same effect. Of all that thou shalt give me, said Jacob, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Shall we who enjoy the full light and privileges of the gospel 
be content to give less to God than was given by those who lived in the former, less favored dispensation? Nay, as the blessings we enjoy are greater, are not our obligations correspondingly increased? Now, that's a good quote as far as its intent in, you know, being faithful and, uh, and so on. But I don't want to miss the points here that I've highlighted. The former uh, dispensation, according to this statement, was less favored, making this dispensation which we are in more favored. So someone say, well, hold on a minute, you're trying to say God is, is favoring one part of history than the other? I'm not saying that, I'm only reading the statement. We are favored with more blessings as a result of the sacrifice of Christ. The people before the cross looked forward to these blessings. They believed them by faith. They looked forward to them and they wished that they would live at the time when they would see them and experience them. That's how the plan of salvation was set up. And these people, even though they were less favored, it doesn't mean they're going to be less saved. They're going to stand on the same sea of glass as you and I will stand by God's grace. They're not going to stand on a lower rung or, you know, a lower level. Everyone's going to be saved equally. But this is how God has set his plan of salvation up. And this is how he carried it out. The plan has to function in time. And there are certain things in the plan that are carried out at certain time events. And so, <clears throat> I think uh, that's enough for the spirit of prophecy. I think there's plenty more, but we'll leave it at that. It's very clear from the scriptures and from the spirit of prophecy that the plan of salvation is revealed. We've only illustrated what, the Bible, what, what we found in the Bible. This is what the New and Old Covenant are about. This is how they relate to each other. This is how it's been set up in the scriptures. To deny that or to reject that, brothers and sisters, you have to come up with some other idea or some other plan. There's plenty out there. But this is how God has set it up. And the reason why it's done this way, so that we can appreciate what we now have as a result of what Christ accomplished on the cross. This promise of salvation is realized. It is accomplished. You see, the new covenant is not about behavior modification. This is not God's plan. It is about a transformation of nature. That's what it is. A new life. That's exactly right. And this is the problem many times in our Christian experience or in our conservative Adventist experience. We are all striving and working hard on behavior modification techniques and methods. This is how we believe one day, someday, we will overcome sin. We might not say it in this way, but you know what I'm talking about? There's this psyche that exists that if we just do this and that, if we just finalize this item and that item and keep this or keep that or give up this or give up that, then I will finally have victory over sin. That is not the new covenant. I have news for you. I want to tell you about the new covenant. That is not the new covenant. The new covenant, brothers and sisters, is to receive the victorious life of the Son of God, the divine human life of the Son. It comes with His victories already accomplished and packaged in one sweet, beautiful package called the plan of salvation. God does not need your assistance to save you. He already has saved you in Christ. All He wants is for you to accept that plan of salvation. So we took the package, unwrapped it, put aside a few things, and we want to add our own things. And we end up with this warped hybrid that is part truth and part error, and we believe that that is the gospel. And we have this miserable experience. We have this miserable journey of one day, brother, someday, I will overcome sin. I just hope it happens before I die. You know what I'm talking about? People, and, and people, you say that and some people say, oh, brother, the work of sanctification is the work of a lifetime. It's like you're going to get sanctified just before you die. That's how it translates in a lot of people's minds. You know, I'm working, I'm growing on a journey, I'm not there yet, but hopefully before I die, I'll reach that stage. Christ has made our sanctification, the Bible says. And we are to live in that and grow in that. And it is indeed the work of a lifetime to grow into that. 
It's not something you arrive at at the end. It is something that you have and you grow in and you continue to grow in. That's what the new covenant is all about. Amen. This new life. Brothers and sisters, we are living in the dispensation of the divine human life of the Son of God. That's the dispensation we're living in. And so that's uh, what it's about. And uh, I want to close with this verse. This is a beautiful verse <clears throat> that relates to what kind of work is required of us. In John 6, verse 28 and 29, the disciples heard Jesus preaching and the people there, and this is what they responded with. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Amen. This is the work of God, brothers and sisters. This is a beautiful verse. That's the element of the new covenant, to believe on him that he has sent. We have in Christ a complete package. There is nothing that can be added to it. Every single blessing that we can receive from God is already given to us in Christ. It's not something that will yet come. It is already given to us. And so, I'll leave it at that. And I pray that we might indeed believe on Him that God has sent. To be in that new covenant. Brothers and sisters, the new covenant is a totally different experience. Maybe to some of us, it's an experience that we have yet to even taste. It could be quite possible that some of us sitting here today, maybe me, maybe you, I don't know, but it's quite possible that we are still in a relationship with God that is not based on the new covenant. We think we're in the new covenant. We claim we're in the new covenant. But in our heart, in our mind, we still operate on the basis of the old covenant. The new covenant experience is a totally different one. The Bible says when the the Pharisees saw the disciples, they knew that they had been with Christ. It will tell, it will show in your life whether you have the life of the Son or not. I pray that we indeed might all be possessors of that covenant. That covenant is Christ. Let's kneel as we close with a word of prayer.